freshly showered Motoko felt much better than blood-coated Motoko. I did have to take a brush to my arms though. Vic was definitely going to give me that look next time I saw him if I let blood stains get stuck in my joints. After spending a good while digging into nooks and crannies of my arms, I walked back into the apartment. Of course nothing was how it should be. For one the windows were all broken. The metal guard was also ruined, a hole punched through a few blinds breaking the whole system. The couch though was the worst. The bullet had smashed through the couch through the wall and continued on, but had caused what little fluff there was left in our ancient couch to balloon out. It was totally wrecked. Gonna need to buy a new damn couch. I had cleaned up the glass before I took a shower, and now here I was. I was on the couch going over the fingers on my left hand still cleaning out bits of grime. I heard it before I realized what it was. The elevator came up and stopped at our floor. I glanced up. The door opened, I was on guard already reaching for my boya that I still had holstered to my chest. I guess I just didn't feel very safe right now without it. But then June stepped into the apartment, his feet practically slamming into the ground. Which was unusual because June had his sneaky feet. Motoko. June didn't quite roar but I rolled my eyes. Serious nemesis vibes June I know you can say more than my name. Yes this is Motoko. I replied flippantly, but decided not to leave it there. Hey June showers free. I told him looking over his own bloody state. He stilled as if trying to restrain himself from acting out at my casual tone. Which now that I think about it was likely exactly what was happening. Suddenly he was on me grabbing me by the arms and lifting me straight off the couch until we were face to face. The towel on my head flopped forward a bit, almost covering one of my eyes, but I couldn't exactly reach it with how June was holding me like this. Do not ever, ever, jump off a building like that again. Are you insane? He didn't quite yell. Instead it was the noise of someone trying to stay quiet, but still wanting to yell. My BD recorder was on when I made that leap. I'll make sure to give you a copy. It was pre t t t tie. I stopped as June shook me like back and forth suddenly. Don't play dumb. He roared and I was silenced mostly because he had given me shaken baby syndrome. Okay first ow. Why? Why are you like this? Why don't you ever listen? Why don't you ever just be safe? Okay I was done with this. My forehead bashed into June's stupid face. Fuck. He cursed as he let me go. Ow. Your face is hard as fuck. I cursed back holding my forehead. Was I bleeding? I was. When did June get his face armored? Ow. But I shook that off. I had to focus on my brother. The last time I had seen him like this. I'm so fucking done with you. He roared into my lack of surprise swung at me. But I wasn't going to let him hurt me whenever he was deep in the throes of cyberpsychosis. I leapt over him, and as I landed, kicked both of his knees out. I rolled just barely avoiding his bulk as he hit the floor with an oof. I picked myself up as June started to do the same. He was definitely heated. You know the last time you swung at me like that you didn't actually aim for me. This time you did. I said, trying to cut through his anger to reach him. He did slow as he stood up he was huffing and puffing. Anger and adrenaline shooting through him. You were supposed to let me help. We were supposed to do this together. You throw yourself into danger over and over and he growled out but he wasn't swinging at me anymore. You never listen. I of course ignored his words. I listened to June all the time. Just not every time. I wasn't his toy after all. You've had a rough night June maybe it was a bad idea to head out on my own, but not because it was dangerous. But because you aren't handling this well. Being attacked at home must have really messed with you huh? I asked and his blazing eyes jerked up to meet mine in a glare. We both were silent. June was visibly holding himself back from whatever he was trying to yell at me. Damn it. Fujimura. I leave my brother in your hands for one night, and he is back to practically full cyber psychosis again. His rants about protecting me, right back to how he was before. I wasn't going to get kidnapped to shock him out of it this time either. Okay June I'm calling an official ceasefire. Go take a shower. Clean up. Get some clean clothes. I demanded pointing at the bathroom. I'm not. Motoko I'm not taking a shower right now. You. Will be here when you come out. Clean, not covered in blood. 
Look at yourself June I said and he blinked slowly looking at a nearby mirror on the wall. It's fine. Your hair is like 90% blood right now. What did you do, hold a scav over your head and rip him in half? No. June that no was a pretty weak denial. Nope, not going to think about that. Take a shower June me. I'll be here, waiting for you when you are done. Then carefully I walked up to him and pushed him. He barely budged at first, but slowly the tension in him eased and he let me push him to the bathroom. Dash. Feel better? I asked, as he came out of the shower patting his damp hair. I'm fine. He grumbled, but I didn't argue about that. June was touchy right now. Come sit. I demanded pointing at the couch and June nodded, settling into the couch in a single big flop that made the poor thing groan. I had grabbed some of his casual clothes for him when he went into the shower, so thankfully he hadn't redressed in his TC outfit. Sweatpants and a t-shirt was good comfy clothing, and June needed comfy right now. Motoko? Yes this is Motoko. I replied cutting him off. I should stop doing that. Kono Super probably doesn't even exist in this world. That joke wouldn't make any sense. But having caught June on the back foot by talking I surprised him. Grabbing the comb and towel I had prepared beforehand I crawled behind him settling on the back of the couch. What are you? Shush. Then I started floofing his hair with the towel. Motoko. June grumbled, and I proved myself the more mature one of us by resisting responding the same way again. Instead I pulled the towel down and started combing my big stupid Oni I chan's hair. Making sure he got all the blood and guts out of it. I had seen June eat his burritos. He was as messy an eater as he was a killer. What crazy thing is going through your head now? He drawled, but I was smiling because that was June speaking and not the angry rage beast. Nothing you want to hear. But if you are asking about me combing your hair, it's because you need a little bit of time to realize that we are safe. Everything is okay. I'm here. Not hurt. You are here. Only a few more bullet holes than normal. Looks like you actually went to a ripper though. So I won't yell at you for that. I told him, having pulled up his shirt to check and see that he had a few new holes in his chest, but they had at least been treated. I'm fine Motoko. I'm more worried about you. Yeah I noticed that. With all the screaming of my name and everything. I told him bluntly. You ran off to get into fights alone. Which is a stealth infiltration specialist. I should get cards. June note for the future. I need business cards. Anyway, as a stealth specialist, going solo is actually pretty safe for me. Which you know. You saw me take out the Rafan that one time, remember? And the scavs that night you were feeling overprotective again. You should have someone watch your back. People don't go solo like that for long Motoko. It only takes one mistake to die like that. When I said you could do as you liked. Piss off anyone you want. I wasn't intending for you to go after them by yourself. This isn't the first scav den I've hit solo June you know that. And it only takes one mistake to die regardless June but I was fine. I went in hard. Full optical blackout, and weapon glitch. Only then did I appear and start killing. But this whole thing isn't about me hitting scav dens. You only get like this when you don't feel safe. I think that's the trigger for your psychosis. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry what I was doing was making you feel unsafe. He didn't say anything, but I could feel the tension still in him as I combed his rather silly hair. But that's fine. This wasn't entirely a rational issue June was having. We had been attacked. We had been attacked somewhere that is supposed to be safe. Of course that would set off June's psychosis. It was something I had come to accept about my new life's brother long ago. June wasn't mentally healthy. He was stable mostly. He was I think getting better, but he wasn't good. I doubt he would ever be good again. Not without a whole lot of therapy, and ripping nearly all the chrome out of him. You aren't hurt? He asked finally out of the blue. I accidentally tripped in some blood and bruised my butt. I told him honestly and it took a moment but my brother's shoulders started shaking a bit and he snorted and snorted and then broke out into full-blown laughter at me. Just as Keikaku. Keikaku means plan. Dash. June was asleep. I had helped dry him off and ended up putting a double XL burrito into him, before making sure he got to sleep. I couldn't actually order him to sleep of course, that would just make him obstinate, 
but he had been up for a long time, and just letting everything go quiet, and calm belly full of warm burrito he had slumped off into his room not long after. Flopping onto the couch I stared at the ceiling for a while just processing. June's mental state. My own less than stellar mental health at the moment. Like the fact I didn't have any more goddamned scavs to kill. I sighed. That was exactly the problem. That urge to keep hunting them. Killing scavs was a good thing, but I wasn't being calm about it. I was too emotionally disrupted myself. But I. I wasn't ready to stop yet. A little more. A little more murder and I would take a break. I just needed more dens to wipe out. Hopefully Wakako would come in clutch. Or Yoko. But it might actually be time to spread out a bit. Wakako only really took care of gigs in a small part of the city. I could reach out to Regina for info. I wasn't sure what our relationship was at the moment, but a free offer to clear out any scav gigs, and Eddie's for info should at least clear up some issues. But that was still only a tiny bit of the city. I was going to need to reach out to Jackie. He knew Padre. That was another piece of the city. That was how serious I was about this. No more. No more letting scavs hide in the corners of the city. They die. Or I do. That was where we were at, and I wasn't about to let myself die to a bunch of scum-sucking scavs. So I needed contacts with all of the fixers. And I needed more chrome. Even as I thought that I winced and wanted to punch myself for being a fool, but it was still true. Okay Motoko. One thing at a time. I whispered and opened my system time to see what I had gained last night. I didn't even know how many people I had killed last night. I hadn't bothered counting. It would be like counting how many cockroaches you squashed. I looked at the alerts and only stopped myself from whistling for June. That was a lot of XP. It took a few moments to count it all up, but yeah. 23,500 XP. I did some quick math. 47? If everyone counted for the common 500 XP? I didn't remember killing anyone super bored out or anything. I shook it off. It didn't matter. I had gained two levels. Going all out. Not worrying about gathering chrome or loot outside of just reloading my ammo. It meant I killed a lot of scavs. I was level 14 now. 2 stat point, 4 skill point. I also had a lot of fun points to play with. Adaptation, or push a stat? In the end I looked at my full character sheet, just to give myself an idea of where I stood. Level 14. 7,515,000. Body 714 due to cyberization, maximum value has increased by 7. Athletics 7. Street Brawler 7. Annihilation 5. Reflex 7. Blade 6. Handgun 6. Assault 6. Driving 7. Intelligence 10. 14. Due to cyberization, maximum value has increased by 4. Breach Protocol 9. Quick Hacks 7. Programming 10. Cool 8. Ninjutsu 8. Cold Blood 8. Rockaboy 7. Technical Attribute 4. 8. Due to cyberization, maximum value has increased by 4. Crafting 4. Engineering 4. 2 stat point. 4 skill point. Perks. Ambidextrous blades 2. Quick draw handguns 2. Gun nut assault 2. Parkour athletics 2. Grappling street brawler 2. Drive by driving 2. Cat like athletics 5. Cool nerves cold blood 2. Danger sense ninjutsu 2. Wall breaking breach protocol 2. Cybersecurity quick hack 2. Recoil reduction. Annihilation 2. Cyber ninja ninjutsu 5. Fearless chill. Cold blood 5. Improvised weapons street brawler 5. Parry blades 5. Robotics wizard crafting 2. Drifting driving 5. Rapid reload handguns 5. Design wizard engineering 2. Rifle ace assault 5. Ghost touch breach 5. Perfect musical memory rockaboy 2. Debug programming 2. Siren song rockaboy 5. Hacking wizard quick hacks 5. Inspired programmer programming 5. AI whisperer programming 10. Unused Annihilation 5. Cyberware. Seicho Electronics MK.2 Adaptation Seicho MK.200. Kiroshi MK1 Adaptation Kiroshi MK1 Half. Militech Condor Adaptation Militech Condor 5 Eighths. Arasaka Smart Link System. 
Adaptation Smart Link 00. Arasaka X Disc Adaptation X Disc 00. Militech Armalite Ballistic Guard Adaptation Ballistic Guard 02. Serrano Air Groove Angles Adaptation Serrano Air 01. So I had a few things. Cool. Despite Rocker Boy giving me a few cool alerts from time to time, Cool hadn't budged in a while. Cool, which was super important, as ninjutsu and cold blood were absolutely integral. What would ninjutsu ten look like? But I also had reflex and body. Both had also been rather locked. Reflex was hard to level as well, needing dedicated time to slowly work on my reflexes, my speed. Something I hadn't really done in a long while. Body was easier. I just needed to hit a gym. Which reminded me I still had a gym membership. A membership I hadn't used in months. Fuck cancelling that was going to get expensive huh? Don't get distracted, Motoko. Did I want to adapt? Or get stronger? It wasn't as easy as you would think. I wasn't even touching on intelligence, and what going over 10 could do for me there. I took a deep breath and exhaled. Okay what do I need? Long term and short term. Long term I was going to need to save points for my stats over 10. And adaptation. Both were integral. Short term? I needed. Cool. I needed even better stealth. Ninjutsu was too powerful to ignore and could potentially save my ass in way too many ways. Also I needed better information gathering, considering my main hold up now was finding the scav so I could murder them. Okay. I wasn't going to use points to increase stats under 10 for now. As useful as it would be, Cool was pretty close to leveling, and I would be better off saving it for things I can't get in any other way. But adaptation was too important to put off. I had already made the decision to worry about my mental health before. So I went and dropped a point into my ankles. Serrano Air Groove Ankles Adaptation Serrano Air 1-1 when I was done I blinked as I got a new alert pop up. Adaptation complete, Serrano Air Groove Ankles. It wasn't a sudden thing. It wasn't like an itch that just went away. Or something that just felt off stopping. Instead it was just a surety, a comfort. Like. Like when you look at your hands and you know every inch of your skin. A comfortable knowledge that everything was as it should be. I pulled my foot up into my lap to check. The real skin that covered my ankle created a sort of seam over the top of my foot, and around my ankle. The skin color was right because Vic was a god among men. But it had always felt weird. Like the ankle didn't stretch to the same points as my old flesh and blood. But now? There was no discomfort as I stretched my foot up and down past the points my old ankle would need to stop. Past the angles left and right it could comfortably move. Because my ankle could. My ankle. I stretched out putting my foot on the table and just kinda looking at it. It felt. Right. This was me. Part blood and bone, and part metal and synth skin. I was Motoko. Cyborg. Yep. As always adaptation was the maybe the most important benefit of my system overall. Others might not think so. They would probably just pump their numbers and borg out and then go crazy. But for me. Being happy was the most important thing. Being happy. I shook it off. I would be happy when the scavs were dead. This was the first time I completely adapted to Chrome. It felt right. This was who I was supposed to be. I forgot sometimes that I was basically trying to pretend to be a cyborg. But I wasn't anymore. I was a cyborg now. Arms ankles, eyes and skin. Bits and pieces here and there were Chrome. Were more than just flesh and blood. And that wasn't a good, or bad thing. It just was. I kinda feel sorry for all the fuckers that piss me off in a year or two. I whispered to the room quietly. Adam Smasher was a high-functioning cyber-psycho. I was just cyber-psycho immune if I took it slow. I had the same ability V did, with Johnny shouldering her chrome addiction. If I went slow and chromed out, I could go full Borg while still being just as fun-loving and happy as I was now. Yeah. That was the goal. I put my second stat point into my subdermal. The slight shift in the way I slouched on the couch to keep the subdermal from getting itchy was by itself super useful. But it was just another step into accepting myself. Stats decided for now, it was time to make some calls, and get some contacts. Information was crucial if I was going to send a message to the scavs. 
First I sent a text to Regina. Martico, been a while. Looking for any information on scav locations. I'll do any gigs that require clearing out scavs for free as well. I didn't get a response back instantly so I moved on. Considering what I was going to do, I sent a text to Wakako. Motoko, going to be reaching out to more fixers for more scav deets. Don't get mad. Good. Wakako can't get mad now. Definitely. I definitely wasn't going to get a weird shit assignment from her the next time I reached out. Definitely. Okay time to call a tune. Hello? Hey Jackie. It's Motoko. You got a second? Oh sure Air Manita, what's up? Scavs attacked me and my brother at home. We're fine, but I'm not taking it sitting down. I'm hoping you might put me in touch with Padre? I'm doing gigs that involve scav hunting for free right now, and paying for any additional scav dens he might know about as well. Whoa whoa, hold up now Air Manita. You got attacked at home? Shit. You should have called me. You need a safe place to crash? June has TC connections, so we have a few of their thugs hanging around keeping an eye on the place. But I'm looking to just remove the problem if I can. Ah little tune, that's not gonna happen. There are thousands of scavs in Night City, if not more. Well I cleared up half a hundred last night, so I think I'm making a good push for it already. I said bluntly. Jackie was cool, but I was kinda sick of everyone treating me like a teenager. Okay Hiromi. I get it. Maybe having a rep does come with some side benefits too. Jesus Air Manita. Really? Yeah Jackie. My brother June was running around with his group of killers and wiping out dens too. So Night City lost a lot of scum last night. But I'm not done. They attacked me in my home Jackie. So can you help me out? Alright. Yeah I'll reach out to Padre. He'll want a face to face. That's fine Jackie. I'm doing prep for tonight anyways. You need another shooter? I'll watch your back if you... No. Jackie. This is for me. Thanks though. If I ever run into some trouble or something, I'll call you. But this is me working through the many angry emotions that being attacked at home has given me. Hey, well can't say I don't understand that. You're good Motoko, solid. Even V thinks so. But don't go thinking that makes you invincible. Be careful. Walk away if you have to. I will Jackie. I don't intend to get flatlined by these scum. Listen, I need to go. Let me know what you hear from Padre. I'll call him right away Amanita. Thanks Jack. We hung up not long after and I sighed relieved. Then I got a text. Wakako, I expected you would reach out for more. Just remember who your fixer is when this is all said and done. And don't be a fool. Be careful who you take gigs from. I couldn't help but snort. Statement of prescience. A threat. And a warning to be careful. Wakako had such a funny attitude to everything. Matako I won't forget, and I'll be careful. Thanks Wakako. Dash. I headed out not long after. Stopped for a moment as I walked through the lobby as the flirt smiled and stood up when I walked by. Matako. Hey. Going out? Need anything? We're here to make sure nothing happens after all. I'm good, thanks. I said blowing past him. Since I was planning on buying some ammo, I called for my quadra and not my kusanagi. You sure? We all know how to shoot. I'm not bad. It's always good to have someone watching your back yeah? Flirt offered and I did my best to ignore him as I stopped to grab some lunch from my favorite meat stick guy. The old man gave me a stilted smile, mostly because of the thug looking over my shoulder. Why was he taller than me? This was bullshit. I should cut off his fucking legs for being taller than me. Idiots are always taller than me. Wasn't he Asian? He should be short. Fuck I was Asian too. Damn it. Thanks. Keep the change. I told the old man as I grabbed my food and since I was getting used to all this future tech my quadra was already pulling out of the garage and parking on the street nearby. Really Motoko, Fujimura Sama gave us this gig to watch you and your brother's back. You should rely on us wait. He called out, but I was already sliding into the car. Not dealing with that right now. I stopped at the gun store I had originally bought the holsters for my guns at. Picked up as much ammo for my boya as I could. 
It wasn't exactly a common cartridge, and even with only the four-round magazines I had been running low. With a new box I was topped up for a good while. Not every day I see a kid using a monster like that. You be careful kid, that thing can break chrome just as easily as bone if you aren't careful. The owner offered as he pushed the ammo box across through the slow in the bulletproof glass at me. Been using the boya for a while now. I know how to handle them. I reply without any heat. This guy didn't know me. I wasn't going to get angry at someone just worrying about a kid running around with a wrist breaker. I paid for my ammo and headed home to drop off the extra. Dash. I blew past the kids in the lobby, rushing up the stairs with my arms full of my ammo. I was going to really prepare for tonight. June was right, getting shot sucked, and a lucky shot could hurt. So I was going to armor up. The armored section 9 suit was a good starting point. I know Night City gonks found wearing too much armor on the streets was something to be made fun of for. What was it? Doughboy? Yeah do boy or do girl if you were caught wearing too much protection. But I didn't care. I was here to murder a lot of people, and while going out in my normal outfit was comfy. There were times I should prepare for actual fucking war. I slipped into my room, June still sleeping. I put on the armored pants and adjusted my boots. Slapped the longer sleeved coat over my leotard. But that was only half done. Going around the couch I grabbed my piece of equipment. The Kang Tao armor had been painted to match my colors, and in less bright orange. I hadn't done much to adjust it to my size fully yet, but it was still good enough. I threw on the main chest rig, securing it with deft hands as it tightened down more than enough to work. A few minutes of adjusting my holsters to give me ease of access, and finally my net gogs over my face to complete the outfit. I checked myself out in a mirror. Honestly the style might be different but I certainly looked like the Major in some of her Black Ops outfits. It soothed me in a way. Even if I wasn't just in my leotard and cosplay outfit, I still looked like Motoko. I still looked like me. I stopped to check in on June he was still asleep. Good. I would have some time to get shit done before he woke up then. I headed out, taking the stairs and walking past the thugs watching the door, ignoring the way they startled when they saw me. Just because I was armored up, and holding my copperhead, clipped to my new vest. The flirt didn't follow me this time as I walked right past him. My quadra was already waiting for me on the street outside the apartment. I slipped in. Jackie had already pulled through. I had gotten an invite. Time to go see Padre. I had received a message from Jackie telling me where to go. It was just surprising that Padre had agreed so quickly, and where I was going. I guess Jackie was pretty well known about the Haywood boys. The location according to my map was a basketball court down in Haywood. It didn't take me long to drive through the city, and even less time to find the right spot. It was the graffiti that clued me in. A giant picture of Padre on the wall was kind of a clue. There was a ton of it. Pictures on the walls of the building all covered in Christian iconography, or just Padre in some way. His name, his face. Weird. But hey I live in a place covered in graffiti tigers so. I had to drive down the road a ways to find a place to park, but unfortunately I stopped then realizing I had fucked up a little. Everyone walking by, or hanging out around the area were wearing normal clothes. I was very much not. I was wearing a cyber soldier's outfit. Armor and weapons galore. Damn it. It would be so embarrassing to have everyone thinking I'm coming to attack Padre. Or if they think I'm a doe girl. My resolve firmed. I had a plan. Dash. Padre aka Sebastian Abara. Sebastian clapped quietly as another basket was made. The boys were having a good game today. The two teams competing against each other were friends. So there was no worry of bloodshed, or violence. A rare thing indeed. He checked the time in his agent for a moment. Jackie had reached out to him, a rare thing indeed. The boy was too independent too set on his path. Yet the respect remained. Sebastian remembered when the boy decided to leave the Tinos. Another rare thing. But Jackie was so well liked, there wasn't much trouble over it. But he had agreed to meet this little tiger that Jackie had fallen in with. Mostly out of respect for her help saving Jackie during the gig the boy had fallen into. Kang Tao was still pushing into his territory in anger at losing the data. Unfortunately as most things, it had passed through his hands quickly, 
and straight into the hands of their enemies. So he was no longer a threat, no longer worth spending the resources to kill. Not that it stopped them from sending a few kill teams after him to cause trouble. They just knew it wouldn't succeed. It was the growling of an injured wolf after all. But even an injured wolf could kill. Which is why Sebastian was out and about acting like nothing was threatening him. Still, a tiger coming into the lair of the wolves of Haywood was always a dangerous thing. Sebastian had of course pulled up the information he had on the girl. It wasn't much, although some words to a netrunner he knew that sent him data gave him a fuller view. A dangerous young girl indeed. Jackie had told him that she had destroyed an AV, disabled an entire squad of Kantau, and yet it was still difficult to believe. But Sebastian was not a man who disbelieved what the information he had confirmed was true told him. A dangerous tiger wanted to meet him, and he knew why. Wakako had been difficult as always, but she answered the question he wanted to know. A scav hunt. It wasn't the first time some angry young killer had come up to him wanting all the information on scavs. It wouldn't be the last. The scavs were rats, but like all rats, when you corner them, they become vicious things, full of teeth. This girl would learn as all young ones did. Or die. A noise came from behind him. Directly behind him. Directly behind him where no one had been. He was sure of it. Only a single row of the old bleachers he was sitting on, and a brick wall. He always sat here, to ensure his back was protected. A folk off. As if someone was trying to get his attention. He turned, standing behind him was a woman. Arms resting back on the guardrail at the top of the bleachers standing casually and trying to not seem like she was threatening him. The fuck padre. Miguel his guard reacted, having done the same thing padre himself had. It was only his hand rising up to calm Miguel that kept a firefight from breaking out. Unfortunately the shout of his guard had caused a disruption to the festivities. Please calm yourselves. Just a planned meeting. He called out to a few of the Tino that were around him, they too reached for guns before slowly calming down. Sorry about this. I was trying to avoid notice. She muttered, with a sigh and Padre realized why Waikuku had described the woman as odd. It wasn't every day Padre was reminded how easy it would be for a true assassin to remove him. Impressive. Think nothing of it, child. You are Motoko? Ah yeah sorry forgot about the gogs. She said reaching up and pulling the tech gogs upwards showing off her very youthful face. Jackie had told him that the girl was young. He had almost forgotten what with having someone actually appear behind him without warning. Mata Goku Sanagi. Thank you for meeting me. Padre. She introduced herself politely and he nodded, waving her forward to sit beside him for one, and so he wouldn't have to twist his neck so much to look at her. She slipped into the seat next to him adjusting the rifle she had strapped to her chest with an unconscious motion before her hands ignored it. He had seen killers who could barely stop touching their weapon. It was a habit of young killers too nervous to stop adjusting the weight of a weapon, and old killers who were twitchy too ready to defend themselves. It was rare he found a killer capable of being utterly calm. Jackie? Where did you find this one? How can I help you? He asked instead his eyes mostly returned to the game, although he never truly stopped watching her out of the corner of his eyes. Any information on scavs you have, or can get. I'll pay an eddies or work. Yes Jackie said as much. You realize it's a fool's errand? If wiping out the scavs could be done, someone would have before. If you have an infestation you don't kill a few of them and call it done. You don't stop until everyone is dead, never to return. She replied with a casual shrug. They started it. Which is actually true. She added quietly as if she had forgotten that for a moment. Then I will give you the information. Haywood scavs have no function in our community. They take and steal and offer nothing back. But I will not assist you further. This war you are starting on, will only cause trouble if I move further. That's fine. Just the location of them is enough for me. And I don't care if no one joins me, or if everyone rises up against them. I just want them dead. I think it will be closer to the former than the later child. He offered, almost wanting to laugh at the idea of the city actually acting to remove the scavs. Even when he was younger the city couldn't work together to remove any of the truly vile gangs. Sometimes they died, but it was usually the act of a single gang, 
or a few working in concert to remove them utterly. The damned clowns for instance. Padre whispered a prayer to the Almighty that the bozos no longer haunted the streets of Night City. It's my personal crusade Padre, she added suddenly as she rose up. It doesn't matter how long it takes. I won't stop trying to remove them. I don't think I can. Take the wisdom learned from the crusades then child. Rarely do they end well for those involved. He answered and she gave him a nod at that. Very well. I will offer you a few locations I would like cleaned up. If you still wish to know more afterwards. We can talk price. He sent her the file he had on a few scav locations here in Haywood. Perhaps he would send her a few gigs as well if she succeeded. She certainly showed her competency to him today. Wakako had been holding out on him, he decided. See you around then Padre. She said and disappeared into a leap that launched her to the second floor. The apartments had small overhangs, and she easily reached the second floor, and then with a leap and then another she disappeared over the building faster than Padre could have moved that distance on the ground. Padre? Do we do anything about her? No, Miguel. She is not a threat to us. Some children will do whatever task is set before them. Some make their own. That young woman has created her own crusade. There is no point in getting involved. He waved his man down and returned to the game. An interesting child indeed. He would have to put together a meeting with young Jackie sometime. Dash. Nailed it. I told myself as I slipped into the quadra to drive off. I had slipped up the building next to my car and then managed to reach Padre with absolutely no one knowing. I had accidentally startled him a bit by landing behind him on the bleachers, but at least no one would think I was a doe girl. I opened the file he had sent and felt a smirk crossing my face. Padre had certainly come in clutch. There were a few different locations, that he had some scav information, and a few rumors put together pointing to some potential spots. Looking out the window I glared. It was still the middle of the day. It was easier to hunt them during the night, but they also could be hunting themselves. I shrugged. I had pretty good armor. A full magazine. And a location full of soon-to-be-dead men. My quadra started up with a rumble and I was gone.